Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us online. We have a special message from the amazing Cares Free G, continuing the series, Come to Me. So get out your Bible and your notes and be ready to hear the Word of God. Hello, church family. My name is Karis Frigi, and I get to share with you part three of our series that we've been in called Come to Me. Um, the last time that I got to speak to you as a church, we were in person and it was back in March and it was before the pandemic and before the quarantine and before words like social distancing were on our lips before we even knew how to wear a mask. So. It feels like um, Andrew keeps saying that it's been decades, if not decades, at least a few years since I have shared with you. So I'm excited, even though you're not here in person, I hope wherever you are that you um, are ready to receive because I think the Lord has a word for us as he's already been speaking through Steve and Andrew the past two weeks in this passage that we're in in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Um, these are what the verses say. They say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I don't know about you, but coming into the month of December, my heart is full of expectation for 2020 to be over. Um, but I also know that just because 2020 is ending, it doesn't mean that the things that happened in 2020 get to end, unfortunately. <laughs> a lot of those things will carry on to 2021. And I need a word like this. I need to know that there is an open invitation from Jesus to us to come to Him and to find rest. So I'm going to talk today just on that first verse, and then next week we're going to hit the next two verses. But I wanted to pray before we get started, just invite the Holy Spirit um, and, and prepare our hearts. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that like what Andrew said, that um, 2020 we thought would be a year where we saw perfectly. And instead it was a year where we felt really like our vision was cut off at moments. But I thank you that you come into view. Lord, when everything else is shaken, the person of Jesus is not shaken. And so I thank you for the 2020 vision of seeing you. And I just ask right now for every person watching and listening I pray that we would collectively consider you, Jesus. We honor you, Father, in your name, amen. So I thought Steve did such a good job a couple weeks ago. He was talking about here we have this invitation in life to try to make it through storms. And when we make it through storms, there's a temptation to hold on really tightly to all these good things, these beneficial things. But all of those things in the end will rip our heart apart if we're not anchored in the person of Jesus. And so that was that part one of this series. And then Andrew last week did share about, I loved this, the 2020 vision. And we're gonna see so clearly and then it feels like literally the whole world collectively has had the wool pulled over our eyes. We don't know who to believe. We don't know how long things will last. And in all of that shaking, the one person that remains unshakable is the person of Jesus Christ. And I think that that, that 2020 vision, the purpose of that is to stir our hearts again as a church to the person of Jesus. Um, recently, I was listening to a pastor out of Australia. His name is Mark Sayers. He has written several books. If you um, want to know culturally and kind of like the time of the church, he is definitely worth your time. And one of the things that he talked about at the start of this pandemic was the importance of the priesthood of every believer which can sound like big words, but it basically means that right now when the church couldn't meet corporately, in some places it still can't meet, we don't really know what the next few months will look like. Like it's really important that we return to knowing that every person, when we believe Jesus, when we are walking with him, we are actually priests before God with him. We get to host his presence even in our home. Some of you haven't been able to come physically to church for different reasons in this time. And I just want to encourage you to cultivate that, to say, I'm a priest before God. And when the church can't meet corporately, it can meet in smaller settings, but it can also happen in just you and your family or you and your roommates. And I love that that's what 2020 has been. It's been a time where we're reconsidering our lives, which has forced us to do what Hebrews so often talks about this phrase. It has this phrase, consider him. And I think everything in life, when you study it to a certain amount, it can almost lose its wonder. But the person of Jesus, the more we consider him, the more beautiful he becomes. 
the more all-sufficient he becomes, the more that I am certain he meets every one of our needs. And so as I'm ending 2020 and I'm looking back, I loved how Andrew said last week, hindsight is 2020. I am seeing that as these different things in my life got removed or got shaken, the person of Jesus never did get shaken. I also love this verse specifically because of the words that it uses. Um, you might ask, why are we looking at this verse? And around Christmas time, there's so much in the Bible that is about the nativity and about Christmas and how Jesus was born. And we have done that before as a church and we will do it again. But I think this verse fits right now um, because it's forcing us to have this consideration of Jesus calling us to himself. I love that Advent really means considering Jesus. It, it's, it's a word that means a coming into place, into view or into being and an arrival. So as we celebrate 2020, Jesus coming into view again, that truly is the advent of our lives. We're, we're celebrating Jesus coming into his rightful place as the only one that can't be shaken. And I know that for me personally, this year has made me a little weary. It's felt like I have labored and it's felt like I have been heavy laden at different moments. I don't know if you are the unicorn of 2020 and every one of your expectations was met and you didn't have any disappointments or any canceled meetings or anything that made you sad or seemed hard. Um, I don't actually know anyone like that that exists. So if that's you, I would love to meet you because you deserve a crown. But for me, this has been a difficult year. And I think for most of us, we have suffered disappointment. Melissa Helser says, if we allow disappointment to sit in our hearts, it clogs the wells. So I just wanna encourage you on your own time, bring your disappointment before the Lord. That is what I've been doing. Um, some of you know our story. About three years ago, our son was four, almost five, and a couple days before Thanksgiving, I found a mass on his side that um, turned into 24 hours later, emergency surgery, and he had a tumor removed from his abdomen. And it was stage four cancer. It was a crazy journey. Many of you were part of that journey with us, and I'm so thankful. Um, long story short, we went through treatment. God was really faithful, but in the last six weeks, we had another confusing set of scans that said that everything had come back and he was given a less than 10% chance to live. And um, I still am like reeling from it. I don't know how God did it, but the spots left on his next scans and he was put in school and he has lived and been thriving ever since. So. I feel like we need to run a lap just for that. Uh, but besides that, um, in the middle of treatment, God began to speak to my husband and I about our family. So we have four kids and um, we had four kids at the time. And I felt like the Lord began to say that we were gonna have a fifth baby. And it was confusing because I didn't want a fifth baby. I wanted all four of my children. And I was like, Lord, I don't want a replacement kid. If I lose a kid, I want all my kids. And just the Lord began to confirm that promise to Chad and I that there would be a fifth baby. Um, and I don't know how many of you know this, but when you go through something hard, you need a promise to hang on to. And for us, that fifth baby began to be this promise of hope and a promise of our family restored. And so a year after treatment was finished, we spent the next year healing because when you go through hard things, I mean, you heal, I'm still healing, right? You heal your whole life, basically from your life. And uh, so I was healing, but the Lord began to say, it's time, it's time to, for this next baby. So we got pregnant. Um, we gave birth to a beautiful girl um, on June 2nd. So it was really my pregnancy dreams fulfilled because at the end of pregnancy, I always wanna go into hiding and the world actually went into hiding for the last three months. So that was awesome. So I was in hiding, had this baby, she was wonderful. And in August of this year, on August 17th, a day that will live in infamy for me, I was taking the kids on a run, came home and was doing some rope climbs in my backyard on a rope that I shouldn't have been climbing. And um, after my third climb, just want you know I could do three climbs. Uh, I got to the top, the rope snapped and I fell and I ended up sustaining a compression fracture to my L1, kind of right in the middle of your back for those of you who aren't familiar. And I was told that I could not pick up this baby that I just had. Um, it has led to a lot of confusion, a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment. Um, and so I come to this verse, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I'm like, man, I can relate to that. And then that second part, and I will give you rest. And I'm like, I need rest. I need to come to Jesus with my disappointment and my questions and saying, God, I thought I heard you and I thought I did what you wanted me to do. And I just went through something hard and I wasn't ready for this. And I think some of us can relate to that, that 2020 feels like you get hit by one wave and you get up and another wave comes. So 
as we approach this first, I just want you to know you're in good company if you feel that way and that there is hope for us. Um, I think it's funny that Advent comes and we have all this expectation. There's this line in O Holy Night. Um, it says, a weary world rejoices uh, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And it's like, yes, all this anticipation. And then it's like, there's a baby. And when you have things like a global pandemic and um, lots of stuff in our nation coming to the surface that's wrong and like, you don't know who to trust. It feels like a, a baby is great. Like a baby is wonderful. I love babies, but how is a baby helpful? for the world problems that we have? How is a baby helpful for my disappointment? How, how does the baby Jesus, it's like, it's cute and we love to talk about it. And I love my baby, she's awesome. But like when I'm in pain and I'm struggling, I'm not like, hey Sutton, just like tell me what to think right now because I'm confused, right? She's a baby. But I think the baby Jesus, what I feel like the Lord has said is that the baby to us represents that Jesus fully submitted to the process of being human. Now, to unpack that, it basically means Jesus became a man and he experienced everything there was to experience. He became a man and he took off his God self. Now he was fully God and he was fully man, but Philippians says that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing and he became a slave and he became obedient to the cross, ultimately so that he could gain the ultimate reward, a name that's above every name. But in that, I find that when Jesus put on humanity, he never took it off. Um, I love that Advent really is a celebration. Dave Matthew says it's a chance not only to celebrate Jesus's taking of human flesh, but also of his keeping it. I don't know why, but just thinking about Jesus in heaven as a man gives me so much encouragement. All throughout the scriptures, we see these little glimpses of heaven through different prophetic books. And there's, it's awesome, but there's a lot of things that are like really confusing and I don't recognize and creatures with wings and eyes. But then you get to John in Revelation and he says, there's a man. And Stephen, when he's being stoned and he says, there is a man, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. There is a man in heaven. And this is why there's a man in heaven, so that he can help us. Um, Dave Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, which I highly recommend, um, he says, it is not only that Jesus can relieve us from our troubles like a doctor prescribing medicine. It is also that before any relief comes, he is with us in our troubles, like a doctor who has endured the same disease. So when I broke my back, I went to spine doctors. They were both great. But I don't think either one of them had ever broken their back, fallen 12 feet and broken their back. So when they would tell me about the pain and tell me about what to expect, it was helpful, but it wasn't the whole story. It wasn't as if they were saying, I fell too, and I can tell you exactly how this goes. Jesus lived. Jesus lived as a man so that when we encounter trouble, we can say, oh my gosh, I have an advocate with the Father. I have someone who knows what it's like to be human. He's, he's in heaven saying, I remember feeling that. I remember the grief that I saw. I remember feeling hot. I remember feeling hungry. I remember feeling thirsty. And he's advocating for the position of humans, for, the, for how we are. He can fully identify as being a human because he is still a man in heaven. In Hebrews 2, verses 16 through 18, it says, For surely it is not angels that he helps, speaking of Jesus, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. I have learned in this process, it is really helpful to know that Jesus felt pain. He knows what pain feels like. He knows what it does to your body. He knows what grief feels like. He knows what confusion feels like. He knows what political upheaval feels like. He knows what it's like to long, to just be able to cherish family moments and like love your family, but have a compelling vision that brings you past your family and past this life on earth. He understands. One of the most healing things I think in the process with my son and then with my back has not been people coming in and saying, Karis, these are the theological reasons for why you should have hope. This is what you need to do. This is how we solve the problem. Instead, it's been the people, sweet friends who sit with me and who can actually just cry with me 
just having someone be present to my pain, with me in my pain, I, I leave and I'm like, I'm so encouraged. And no one said anything. They just, they just were with me and they actually cried, which seems like it should be depressing, but it's not. And I feel like the church globally, we could use that, that idea that Jesus is with us. He's with us and he can relate to us and he wants to help us because he's a merciful and a faithful high priest. I love that Steve said that Jesus didn't live to preach. So he wasn't trying to find strategic times to like insert this message because it seemed good, make sure they know I'm the vine, make sure they know I'm the bridegroom and like I'm gonna do it here. And he wasn't calculated with this like political agenda to make sure he really gets it all out there so that we know what team we're on. Instead, he was preaching as he lived. He was preaching from the place with the Father. So I think when he lifts up his voice and he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, he's like, I understand the human condition. I, I have felt heavy. I have felt weary. Uh, we get this actually, the word labor means to grow weary, tired and exhausted with toils or burdens or grief. In John chapter four, when Jesus sits beside the well and the woman comes to the well and they have this whole conversation about living water, it says in verse six, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. I won't even go into like the prophetic, like Jesus knows what to do when you're weary, you sit by a well. So if you're weary, sit by a well. But he goes to this well because he's weary. He's actually physically tired. I love that Jesus didn't float around on like this glory cloud that took him like one level above humanity. And he's like, oh, y'all are hungry. Okay, I'll break the bread. He's hungry too, you know? He's tired too. He's weary too. He limited himself so that he can experience what we're experiencing. That's true comp compassion from his heart for us. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is encouraging his disciples, hey, stay awake, stay awake. And of course they all sleep, right? And it says they're sleeping from sorrow. And he even says, my soul is troubled to death. That's not him saying, I'm gonna stay above this. I'm gonna stay above the pain. I'm gonna stay above what I have to experience because I'm God and I can, I don't really have to feel it. Instead, he chose, no, I'm gonna experience this with them. I'm gonna experience the dread and the fear of death. I'm gonna experience the heaviness of this anticipation my whole life. And Isaiah, it says that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, which I don't always love that passage, but when I'm going through something hard, I'm really happy that he knows what it's like, right? Then he also knows what it's like to be heavy laden. In fact, this, this word heavy laden means to load with a burden like a workhorse. And he rebukes the Pharisees or the religious leaders of his time in Matthew 23. He says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. What he's talking about is these religious leaders who are like, hey, there's a gap between humanity and God. And in order to bridge the gap, you gotta do all this work. And so Jesus is watching every day as he's teaching in the synagogues, people coming in, bearing this heavy burden of like, I have to get myself there. I have to be good enough. I have to fulfill this. I have to make enough money to make the right sacrifices and to buy the right meats and to make sure that I'm clean and I can't touch a Gentile and the rules and the heaviness and the burden of life. And Jesus, I think when he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, it's out of like this, this welling up of frustration in his soul of saying, it's not supposed to be this way. We're not supposed to be carrying this heavy burden on our own. And so he's bringing us back to this invitation. And it brings me to the question of like, Jesus, why? Why, when you could do anything, would you submit yourself to the process of being human with me and feeling weary and fearing, feeling heavy laden? And I love that in John, it says in, in John chapter 13, verse one, now before the feast of the Passover, right before Jesus dies, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I think that's where we can rest our hearts. He chose to come and to be weary and to be heavy laden because he loved us. And then I love that the, the second half of this verse we're looking at after he says the come to me part, he says, and I will give you rest. To me, that's him nailing it. Every human wants rest. 
Have you noticed that like the mattress industry is like really growing? I don't know if you have, but we're about to buy a new mattress. And, and it's just fa fascinating how many there are online and like rest and stress and how to live a life of ease. Everyone wants to live their best life and be stress-free. And it's because our hearts are just weary. There's something about this disconnect between us and what we were made to experience like in the Garden of Eden. And I think along with the curse came this, this call for Adam. He said, hey, you're going to work the ground. And for the woman, hey, it's going to be hard. You're going to labor, literally labor, and it's going to be hard. And it's not going to be pleasant. We lost the rest. And that's what Jesus is calling us back to. Hey, I want to I give you rest. And so I was kind of praying through the scripture, like, Lord, why does this passage talk about rest? And, and how do we get rest? Rest means to cause or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. It also means to be refreshed. So God, like, why, why did Jesus say, come to me and I'll give you rest? What does he mean? I felt like the Lord said, just back up to the verse right before this. In Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus makes this incredible claim. He says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. And I believe that when Jesus came and He's giving this promise of rest, the rest He's talking about actually comes from our view of the Father being restored. See, our hearts are heavy and we're working so hard in life and we don't really know why we're working and no one wants to come to this distant or remote deity and kind of unburden ourselves because it doesn't feel safe, especially if you think he's gonna punish you and if you think that he doesn't have grace or if you think his grace wears out if you do certain things and it just cannot feel safe. And so when you don't feel safe, you can't rest. And Jesus understood this so well. In fact, I think Jesus practiced rest his whole life by practicing putting the Father where the Father was. He understood who the Father was, Father God, and he wanted that image to stay. He felt the temptation because he was tempted in every way we are. I think he was tempted to despair. God, where are you in pain? Why are there so many people in pain? And he always knew who the Father was. But he also had this chance that he says, I get to show the Father to all of you. And I think rest comes from a glimpse of the Father restored. Sometimes I'm tempted to think that Jesus is the benevolent arm of the Trinity. Like he did all this good because he's like placating the Father and the Father's in heaven and he's kind of mad. And Jesus is like, hang on, don't, don't like exercise judgment yet. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna die. Like I'm gonna do all this stuff and I'll tell you what humans are like and you don't have to be so mad. But instead, I think it's the Father and the Son, and the Son is the expression of who the Father is. So everything Jesus did on earth, if you want to blow your mind for a minute, think of it as the Father actually doing it. I'm going to walk us through just a few examples. In Luke chapter 7, there's this widow, and Jesus is walking into the city of Nain. He's just coming in, and there's a widow who's following a coffin of her only son. And it's an adult son, and the widow's weeping. And Jesus is so moved. The widow hasn't even asked for anything, but he walks over to the coffin. He makes them stop and he raises the man from the dead. And it's just because death troubled him. Now that wasn't just Jesus as a man, that was Jesus revealing the heart of the Father, that death troubles him. He knows we weren't made to experience death like that and it breaks his heart. In Psalm 146, it says, the Lord watches over, the Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow in the fatherless. I think that verse explains this Old Testament promise and Jesus is living it out. Jesus is the exact representation of who the Father is. Then there's a man in Matthew 8 and he's covered in leprosy and he walks up to Jesus. And in that time, leprosy would have made you, not only could you not be with your family, you couldn't worship, you were on the outskirts of the city. He walks up to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can clean me, you can make me clean. And I think sometimes we come to God and we're like, yeah, he's able, but like probably not willing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he's gonna teach you something through this way. He's probably not willing. And here Jesus says, I'm willing be clean. That's God in heaven saying, I'm willing, be clean. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins, who heals your diseases. He heals your diseases. Jesus is coming, revealing who the Father already was that we'd forgotten, that life had blinded us to. Luke chapter 13, I love this one. 
um, it seems pertinent to me. There's this woman, she comes in to the synagogue on the Sabbath and she can't even fully straighten herself up, which as I've been studying compression fractures, if you have multiple, there's a danger of you having this thing that actually bends your back over. And Jesus calls it a spirit of infirmity, which is also interesting. But Jesus sees her and he heals her on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are like, come on any other day to get healed. Why did you have to come on the Sabbath? And Jesus is like, think of it. She has been dealing with this for 18 years. Think of it. And I love that phrase because it shows that his heart, his heart, the Father's heart is moved and he wants to show compassion. In Psalm 56, written of the Father in heaven, it says, you have kept count of my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? The Father keeps count of tossings, of people uncomfortable and in pain. And Jesus reveals that. Then in Luke chapter seven, the last example, there's a woman who she comes and washes Jesus's feet with her hair and she dries them with her tears. And she's she's just in love with Jesus because she was a woman who lived on the streets and with all that means, probably a prostitute, lived a rough life, but she loves Jesus. And Jesus is like, because you did this for me, because you loved me a lot, your story and the gospel will now forever be hand in hand because God himself is moved by people loving him. And Isaiah verse chapter 30, verse 18, it says, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. He exalts himself or he longs to show mercy to you. God in heaven is not like, hey Jesus, just go deal with this like annoying people group and like make them happy so that I can actually interact with them. God's like, my heart is for my people to know who I am again, because he knows if we see him correctly, our souls actually have a chance to rest. Our circumstances might not necessarily shift. Things might not change around us, but our souls, who we are, can find rest. John 1 verse 18 says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He, speaking of Jesus, has made Him known. Jesus, because He was in the bosom of the Father, can come and show us who the Father is. So I just wanna encourage you as you approach this week of Christmas and you're looking at the birth of Jesus, would it remind you, man, He knows everything I've gone through. He knows what it's like to be a human. He knows what it's like to feel all the things that I've been feeling and he offers me rest because he's restoring my vision of who God is. And God is a God who wants to give our souls rest. So that's what I'm praying for you this year. I'm gonna close with a prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for right vision, for Jesus being on display. And we thank you, Jesus, that you came to restore the image of the Father for us. I pray that you would reveal who the Father is to every single person watching. In your name, amen. Have a great week and Merry Christmas.